following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. In the Gnostic tradition, we are firstly concerned with studying the, the laws and the facts of our existence. So when we apply ourselves to study, to reflection, to analysis, it is upon the facts that we rely. And from this point of view, it's important that we cultivate an ability to discard theory, belief, but most especially those theories and beliefs that we have about ourselves. You see, gnosis, this word which comes from the Greek language, means knowledge. But it isn't book knowledge. Gnosis is not intellectual knowledge. It is also not mere belief or something that we... um, appreciate or agree with and imitate. Real Gnosis cannot be imitated. Real Gnosis is self-knowledge. It is experiential. It is conscious. It is something that we acquire through self-reflection, through analysis of our mind, of our heart, of our soul, of our body, of everything that constitutes what we call a human, a humanoid or a human being. Real Gnosis begins there with analysis of oneself. In order to acquire that, we study the teachings, we study scripture, we study theories, we study a philosophy, We study a science. But all of that study, if it remains merely as theory or merely as philosophy, is useless. It is a waste of time if it remains merely that. And the reason this is important is because at the level of theory, and dogma, and philosophy, ideas, and beliefs, we have not yet reached consciousness, soul, what is our true nature. 
When we have theories and beliefs, when we have ideas, when we have dogmas, we may have different types of behaviors or activities related with those phenomena. But when something becomes conscious, cognizant, when it's something that emerges out of one's soul, it is something real, something that is alive, something permanent. You see, when we study the Gnostic tradition, that is our goal. It is to acquire a kind of knowledge that is eternal, that is immortal. It is to acquire gnosis, conscious knowledge, and to grasp that is something psychological, spiritual, internal. It is not physical. It is not acquired by adopting habits and behaviors or adopting beliefs and theories. It is acquired by awakening one's own cognizance, the consciousness, active, intelligent, and aware. This is, in Sanskrit terms, called jnana. It is a type of knowledge that is not intellectual. A type of knowledge that is related with consciousness, or soul, essence, the Buddha nature. This sort of intelligence, or Cognizant knowledge does not arrive mechanically. It does not come to us by inheritance. It doesn't come to us through a religion or a book. It comes through experience. Gnosis is acquired through experience, not lectures, not books. Not any teacher. I cannot give you Gnosis. I can talk about it. And when we lecture and when we give these teachings, we discuss it and explain it, but we cannot give you Gnosis. You have to get it yourself. And it isn't gotten through intellect, through reading. It isn't acquired by accepting or believing in what we say or what you read. It is acquired through conscious awakening, through experience. The moment as a child, when you first experienced rain or a beautiful sunset, or you saw your first dog and you felt that astonishment that was Gnosis. It was a moment of experience that no one can ever take away from you. Something that you tasted and touched and saw and experienced for yourself. That is Gnosis. But it is only Gnosis in a very small level. When we study Gnosis, what we're interested in is not so much how physical matter works, but how physical matter fits into the overall scheme of matter. Because physical matter is only the lowest level of existence. It is just a fraction. What we are physically is but a little tiny corner of what exists. What we truly are is what we need to find out. We need gnosis of that. But unfortunately, we still don't really have gnosis of what we are physically. We still, as quote, civilized and advanced as we claim to be, 
only use a fraction of the power of our brain. We have no cognizance of all the functioning of our physical organism. In fact, if you observe us in a scientific way, you could say we're actually trying to destroy our physical organism because we force it to consume and digest all kinds of chemicals and types of material that don't belong there. We inhale, we breathe in, we drink, we eat. With our physical body, all kinds of materials, elements that do not belong there. But worst is that we take those elements in through the mind. We put into our mind all kinds of elements that really don't belong, that really do not create health psychologically. We are addicted to all types of substances physically, but worse, we are addicted to all kinds of substances in the mind. Elements like violence, greed, lust, envy, So in Gnosis, in this tradition, we discuss this situation a lot in order for us to begin to acquire Gnosis of how we do it. And as lectures and in the books, you'll find many examples that we give. Things to stimulate your own study, your own self-reflection. So it isn't enough for you to listen to our examples and look just for that in yourself. What's necessary is to find how you function as a body, as a heart, as a mind. So in the last lecture, the previous lecture, we heard about different aspects of our inner psychology, which are represented in the Bible as example of Cain and Abel. We heard about our divine nature, our human nature, and our animal nature. And through listening to lectures like that, we hear examples and explanations of psychological structures within our field of awareness, things that we can come to know and observe in ourselves. And we hear a lot about the ego and a lot about the consciousness and the difference between the two. But these explanations are meaningless unless you can see the difference in yourself. And not just once, but continually watching for that distance, that difference between them. But there is a key element that makes an enormous difference in how we study and learn and most of all, comprehend this teaching and ourselves. And that is an element that isn't symbolized very much in religions and isn't talked about very much in religions because it's only in recent centuries, recent decades, really, that it has become such an incredible problem. You see, in ancient times, our personality was more passive. What we have as a personality has now become very active and a big problem. This word personality gets used a lot nowadays. Of course, it comes from Latin, personae, which means mask. Nowadays, people use this word in a lot of different ways to mean a lot of different things. But in the Gnostic tradition, the meaning is very specific. It does mean mask. But a mask, the way we think of the definition is something that hides 
we always think of a mask as a, uh, a, a interface to hide behind, something that hides our identity or something that, that, will, uh, that you can be disguised within. And it's true, that meaning is there. But the original meaning, the original use of the word persone was for an actor. It was for that tool that one soul would use to communicate to another soul. So a mask in that way is a filter, an interface, a device that's utilized for communication. So in ancient times, when dr the dramatic arts were still a conscious art and a way of teaching us psychologically and spiritually, the actor utilized a persona, a mask, in order to communicate the ideas and the teachings of that particular drama. This was true in the Greeks, the Egyptians, the ancient Hindu, the Aztecs, the Maya, in all traditions amongst the Asians, the Tibetans, for example. All of these civilizations have great psychological teachings hidden in their stories, in great operas, in great epics. And the actors, or the dancers, or the ones who present the teaching would use personae in order to teach through those dramas. This is where this word comes from. We have a personality, a mask. We haven't discussed it a lot in this tradition because really it is impermanent. The personality that we have is fleeting, temporary. It, is, um, it has no real substance. It is somewhat vaporous or ephemeral. It is like a silken veil. Well, at least it should be like that. In each existence that we have, we are born into this physical world. We emerge from the womb of our mother with a physical body. And that physical body is a, is a emergence of our past action, condensed into matter. And as we grow, as we develop physically, our consciousness or soul is within that body. And in order for that consciousness or soul to interact with the outside world, it needs an interface. It needs a personality, a mask, in order for the communication to flow back and forth. So little by little, as a child, we begin to learn. We begin to learn about how to communicate through our facial expressions and bodily movements, waving our arms and legs, crying, laughing, smiling. We learn to talk. We learn our language. We learn the customs and morals of our family, of our village, of our town, of our city, of our country. We learn how to behave. This is all personality. We are given a name. We acquire a culture. We acquire morals. This is all personality. So when you reflect upon yourself with this Gnostic point of view, you have to become aware of what your personality is. The name that you have, 
the heritage that you have, the culture you grew up with, the moral values that you have. You see, we tend to take all these things for granted. And we tend to assume that all of these things are right and good. And we tend to be proud of it. We tend to take pride in our cultural heritage. And we tend to think ours is better than everyone else's. Now this is where things get interesting. Because you see, this personality was born with this body. So all of this cultural heritage that we're so proud of, the language we speak, the religion we grew up with, the country we came from, the music we listened to, the politics, the morals, all grew around the development of this body. We think it is ourselves, that it is our identity. Yet, this is not the only body that we've had. It is also not the only personality we've had. As a serious student of gnosis or conscious knowledge, one has to begin to question this point of view of pride in personality. We make a lot of assumptions that this personality is right and that the point of view we have culturally is good. Some of us may have had the good fortune to live in another country different from the one we're born in. And with that type of experience, you are presented with a radical difference of personality. Particularly if you've gone from one extreme to another, culturally, socially, economically. For example, someone who's grown up in Canada, or the United States, or Europe, who then suddenly spends time living in a place like Guatemala, or India, or China, will suddenly see themselves in a totally new way. They will be able to see things about their personality that they never, ever would have seen before. This is a valuable experience and can teach you humility and can teach you how temporary and blind the personality really is. You see, in your past existences, you may not have been the same sex that you are now, the same race, from the same country. So all of these assumptions that you make about how your country is so great or your language is so superior or your religion is so elevated are really all just based on the experience of this one life, this one existence. Whereas in past existences, you may have been Egyptian, you may have been Nordic, you may have been African, you may have been from any part of the world with a totally different religion, a totally different culture, totally opposing tastes, yet the same consciousness and the same ego. You see, the personality is a mask. It is a communication device that we create in each lifetime. So in this life, if you're very proud of your religion or very proud of your culture, you were probably the same way in your previous existence, but with a different culture, different religion. The pride is the same. The consciousness is the same. It's asleep. The culture is different. Personality is different.
when you analyze yourself in this way, you suddenly start to see yourself a little bit differently, right? Like all of a sudden, these assumptions you've made about yourself may not be true. Am I really this person that I've always thought? Who was I before and how different? These are valuable questions to ask. But in order for us to really ask them, we have to learn how to let the personality become passive. In this culture, this worldwide culture, which is strongly being influenced by the West, the personality is being worshipped. And all of us are becoming victims of the cult of personality. The word cult means worship, reverence. We associate the word cult now with certain types of sects, groups that become fanatic. And it does have that association. But the original meaning of the word means to worship, to revere. And we've all heard about cult of personality, where a particular person will attract worshipers and make them into fanatics and make them blind. And we've seen this time and again through the centuries, but most especially in the last few decades where the cult of personality has become extremely strong. Why is that? It's because we have entered a phase of our development in which new energies and forces are working upon us as a psychology, in which we need to emerge or to create a new kind of personality. But unfortunately, because we are asleep, we are not conscious, those energies polarize. And instead of us developing our solar personality, we are developing a lunar personality, our mechanical personality. We are all victims of a cult of personality, but the one that we worship is our own. Sometimes we worship an outside personality because that outside personality makes our inner one feel good. Many people come to spiritual movements seeking the guru, the master, and put their own development, their own realization into the lap of another person which is impossible because the only one who can redeem us is within. The cult of personality that we suffer from the most is by believing that this personality is real and by giving it whatever it wants. We have lost touch with the consciousness, the soul that which is our true nature, Atman, Chesed, Buddha, the spirit. Instead, we worship this personality that we've made in this life. The personality that we've made in this life worships money, loves status to be successful, to be admired. And you see, the way this works is that this physical body that runs around and does all its activities every day does it through the personality. But the personality is just a puppet. Just like the physical body is just a vehicle. It is a tool that something else uses. 
Every night, you go to sleep, and your tool rests and recuperates itself. And that which was operating the tool goes out. But what is that that goes out? During the day when the physical body is active, something is moving it, causing it to be active, to go to work, to go make money, to go to school, to study, to go talk to people, to go and get whatever it is we're trying to get, to acquire things, right? This is basically our goal every day, is to acquire things, to get things. But what and why? Do we question that? Do we really look into our motivations? And what is stimulating us to act the way that we do? You see, the personality is this mask on the body. It is the filter that we use that speaks the way we speak, that uses the facial expressions we use, that uses the words we use, that dresses the way we dress. None of it is really real. It is all imitated. It is all learned. People nowadays are very much attached to how they present themselves, to their appearance, to how they dress, to how they talk, to how they walk. But every culture is different. And in every country, there are many cultures. Yet every one of them is merely imitating. Among different age groups, in different cities, in different types of arenas in life, we find all different forms of personality. For example, if you want to be successful in business in New York City or Chicago, you have to dress a certain way, you have to talk a certain way, you have to own certain things, you have to look a particular way. Otherwise, you will never be accepted. You will be shut out. Right? And in order for you to learn those things, you go to school. You study. And you learn to imitate. You learn to dress the right way, to talk the right way, to know the right lingo. Right? If you want to be a truck driver, you can't wear a suit and tie and talk like you came from Yale or Harvard. If you want to be a police officer, you have to learn the culture, the personality of the police, the words, the language, the way they do things. That's all personality. If you want to be a school teacher, it's the same. If you want to be a rock star, it's the same. You have to learn the culture. You have to look the part. You have to act like a rock star. Right? In other words, you have to conform to fit in. This is all personality. What's most interesting and uncomfortable is when you look at the development of your personality over time, especially if you're an older person. If you look carefully at it, you will see that as you've moved from circumstance to circumstance in your life, you have altered your personality in order to accommodate those circumstances. And it's necessary to do so. For example, when you go to, to uh, elementary school, your personality functions in a given way, and you talk a certain way and you relate to others with elementary school concepts and terms and feelings and things that you talk about and things you don't talk about. And then when you go to middle school, it's different. When you go to high school, it's different. 
When you go to college, it's different. When you start a job, it's different. When you go from one job to another job, the culture changes. Your personality changes. When you acquire new friends, you begin to use different words, different language. If you go from one part of the country to another part of the country, you may find that you change how you speak, how you dress, how you carry yourself. Why? Personality. Personality is not a fixed, permanent thing. It is born alongside the body, and it dies alongside the body. The personality that you have is not real. This person with such and such a name, with such and such experiences and morals and thoughts and ideas, is fake. Is fake is not real. So all the time and energy that we spend trying to dress ourselves a certain way, trying to speak a certain way, trying to show ourselves a certain way is a waste of time. In certain cases, it's necessary for us to have a decent life, to work, to raise a family, to feed ourselves and take care of ourselves. We have to be decent citizens. We have to be upright, decent people. It doesn't mean that we should throw all that out. We need a personality. It is necessary. But the personality should be passive and under the service of the spirit, the consciousness, our true identity. Not in the service of the ego. It is our ego who wants to be famous, who wants to be rich, who wants to be recognized and admired. It is our ego who wants to be envied, who wants others to respect us. It is our envy that wants to have what our neighbor has or what that superstar has. It is our greed that wants security, that wants money. It is our gluttony that wants to have all the food, when we want it, how we want it. And incidentally, these taste for things is all personality too. Many of us have this concept, this idea, that we can only eat certain kinds of food. And we're only happy if we eat those kinds of food. And we tell ourselves, well, I'm just like this. I only eat these kinds of things, these times of day, in these places, and that's it. That's all personality. Because in your last existence, you were eating totally different things and acting the same way. We need to see those things about ourselves. We need to see how this personality is a tool that can be used either by the ego or by the spirit. But when the personality is fat, when the personality is very strong, the ego e uses it easily. That's how the personality gets that way, is because of the ego. In order for the spirit to work through us, the personality has to be passive. It has to become transparent, clear. This is how God, the spirit, can work through us. So then there are different forms of personality that we need to understand. In each body, we create a personality. So through your successive previous existences, you've had many personalities. And depending on what happened to your body in your last existence, your personalities could still be around. You see, if your last existence, your body was buried, or that physical form is still in some type of uh, shape, the personality that you had, depending on how strong it was, how fat it was, could still be there, hanging around the body. This is what people call ghosts. It is related to the personality. It is related to the vital body. 
It is that name, that history, those memories, that way of talking, that way of dressing, that way of behaving. It's personality. It's a mask. It doesn't, it's not anything but energy. Like silk. That's why the ghosts are semi-transparent, insubstantial, because the personality is that. It is nothing. It is like cobwebs. So all these personalities that we've made, that we always think is our real self, is not our real self. The ego is also not our real self. The ego is just a collection of conflicting desires, aggregates, samskaras, many different types of desires related to many different types of things that we made through our personality, through our body, that in turn control the personality and control the body in order to feed themselves. From existence to existence, our pride which always wants to feel admired and wants others to respect us, has been proud because we were Hindu. And then it was proud because we were Native American. And then it was proud because we were black. And then it was proud because we were white. And it's proud because we're Christian or a Jew. Or now, a Gnostic. Even worse, a Gnostic. You see, we carry all this baggage, these many egos, these many eyes who fight over each other and seek to dominate, to have control over the personality. Because through the personality, they can enter into the physical world and get what they want. So through our day-to-day -day life, all these thoughts and feelings that we have, this continual stream of activity in the mind, that is all our egos. Oh, why is this person mad at me? And what can I do? And I need to conquer this other business and compete with them and knock them out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do better than them. I'm going to make more money than they are. I'm going to drive them out of business. Greed, fear, pride, anger, envy using our personality and our body. Meanwhile, our consciousness is asleep. We have no awareness, no cognizance, no watchfulness of what's happening in us psychologically. We go on autopilot. We just go from activity to activity, believing we are spiritual, believing we are awake when we are asleep. We believe we are good Buddhists or Gnostics or whatever we call ourselves when in fact we are asleep. When we sleep at night, our consciousness goes out. The body rests. Most of us have no awareness of this time. And if we have any awareness of it, it's very vague. We awake in the morning and think, oh, I dreamed about a giant frog wearing a tutu. And there were some brownies there. Right? We have no real idea of what happened for those eight or ten hours. Why? Because we sleep all day long. Because consciously we are not here and now in our body controlling the personality and managing our mind. Instead, our consciousness is doing what it does at night. It is being controlled by desires, by fear, by greed, by the longing for love, by the craving for sex, by the desire for comfort, for recognition. Because we're that way all day long, we're that way at night. In other words, we have no cognizance, no consciousness, no awareness. We are not awake. If we awaken consciousness now, not tomorrow, now, 
and become aware of ourselves now and watch our mind now and continue with that effort day to day, hour to hour, moment to moment. Suddenly, we also start to become aware of ourselves in dreams. Then we begin to see how the personality is always being manipulated by our desires. How our personality is being manipulated by others, by people around us, to get what they want from us. Little by little, we start to control it. But make no mistake, you cannot strengthen your personality to control your personality. But this is a mistake many people fall into. They think, I'm going to be a good Gnostic. I'm going to be awake from now on. I'm going to meditate six hours every day. And they try so much to put this effort. But it is an effort of personality, not consciousness. You see, the effort to be is simply the effort to remember oneself. It doesn't take a huge exertion to remember oneself. It simply takes awareness. This is why Samuel and Vior told us it does not take exertion. If you're exerting yourself, you're doing it wrong. And then the students say, but I thought we're supposed to make super efforts. So it sounds contradictory. It isn't. It is a matter of perspective. Inner attentiveness that emerges from inside, related with the pineal gland, as the lecture of last week emphasized. This inner attentiveness sees the mask. It is aware of the mask, the personality. But most of all, it lets the personality deflate and allows the consciousness to manifest not desire. In other words, instead of going around all the time trying to feed our desires, trying to act like a big shot, trying to impress everybody, we learn to just be. We learn to be authentic. Do you know what that means, to be authentic? It means to be what your being is. To be natural. To be oneself. not easy in this time because everyone wants us to be something that we are not and we want to be something that we are not we look at our body and we feel ah oh, my body is not good enough I wish my body was like A and B and C oh my education is not good enough right this is all personality But with cognizance, with remembrance of God, one looks inside and says, this body is impermanent. This personality is impermanent. What is real is spirit, Atman. That self who is eternal, who is forever, who is God. Why should I worry if somebody thinks I don't dress well? As long as I'm dressed decently, it's enough. Why should I worry if someone thinks that my car is cheap or has a scratch on it? Why should I worry if my speech sounds uneducated? Why should I worry if my skin is darker than my neighbor or lighter than my neighbor? When I have God, my innermost, when my Divine Mother is there, who has loved me when I was black, when I was white, when I was Mexican, when I was Indian. Why should I worry when the world judges me because of my religion, because of my hair color, because I have a bad haircut? All of that deflates the control of personality. 
self-remembrance, self-cognizance. Of course, we've explained many times that this is the first step to acquire real gnosis, right? Self-observation and self-remembering. A deep and continual observance of one's own psychology. But that's only the beginning. There are some groups who claim that that is everything. That simply through awareness, one can reach God. Not a single scripture agrees with that. Not one. There are many groups in this time, famous people, who make this proclamation. Just by being aware of yourself, it is enough. I'm sorry, but it's a lie. If it were that simple, we would all be angels already. We would be done. Because that's easy. It may sound hard when you're asleep, but self-cognizance, self-observation, self-remembering simply takes self-awareness. Even the black magicians can do it. Even the demons are aware of themselves. That doesn't take you to God. What takes you to God is spiritual birth to create the soul, the chariot that Krishna rides in. The soul represented by those brothers of the Mahabharata, the Pandava brothers, which the lecturer mentioned last week. The soul, which is the solar bodies, the vehicles of gold, the Merkaba, the Sahu, amongst the Egyptians. This vessel, this vehicle, through which our solar personality emerges. You see... As we are now, we have a lunar personality. It's called lunar because it is a gift of the Divine Mother, the moon. In ancient religious theologies from around the world, we see two fundamental symbols, the sun and moon. The sun is Surya, Apollo. Ra, the sun god. Christ. But the one who gives us birth, who initiates our process of development, who puts us on the lunar path, is the Divine Mother, Soma, the moon. That natural unfoldment of mechanical nature. But to transcend the lunar path and enter the solar path, requires spiritual birth, a terrible revolution, psychologically and spiritually, in oneself. One has to rebel against one's own mind to become a lord of everything within oneself, to be in command of one's own nature. And that process is one in which everything within us that is lunar goes through a great transformation it all must die. And out of that death is a new birth. A solar birth. In which the Lord emerges. The Lord is our innermost. It is our spirit. But clothed with a new vessel. The solar bodies. That vessel is a solar personality. Samael and Vior accomplished this. And so did many other great masters. A process within which the lunar mask is dissolved. And what is used instead is a solar personality. You hear the word solar. It has soul in it. But also soul for sun. The solar personality is Christic. It is divine. Nonetheless, it is a personality, but immortal. The lunar one is impermanent. We make a new one with every existence. A solar personality is forever. It is permanent. 
We need that. We need to create a solar personality. When looked at from this angle, we can see, if we look at the tree of life, we see these bottom four sephiroth, or spheres, which represent our lunar psychology. The bottomless sphere represents our physical body, which is Malkut in Hebrew. The next one up is Yasod, which represents our vital body or body of energy. And these two are really one. They cannot be separated. Above this, we have Hod, or the astral body, the emotional body, which is where we have our feelings and emotions and our dreams. And then next we have Netzach, the mental body, the intellect, the mind, which is also where we dream. These are where we classically relate our ego. We talk about our ego in relation with them. Because really, ego is from here down. Ego, self, I, the false I. Desire, samaskaras, aggregates. Many names for these demons that inhabit our mind. The lunar personality is what works in conjunction with these aspects of our psyche. From day to day, moment to moment, if we observe ourselves, we see thoughts. This is netzah. How the mental body works through the personality and the physical body. Hod. Emotion. The emotional body, but lunar, which works through our personality and body as feelings, as longings and urges in the heart. The vital body and the physical body are very clear. Energy. And, mo and action physically. When we observe our three brains, intellect, emotion, and body and action, we need to see what are the impulses that are manipulating my mind, my heart, my body. Not here in the classroom. It's good to do it here in the classroom and when you're listening to lecture. But you need to remember this when you're at your job, when you're at school, when you're with your spouse or your family, that is when you have to watch. It isn't enough to just believe in Gnosis or to accept the teaching as a nice theory. This won't get you anywhere. You have to live it. To live it means to be awake, to be aware of yourself in your day-to-day -day life and to watch your mind and to control it to change those old mechanical ways of behaving. You see, lunar means mechanical. The lunar processes of nature are mechanical processes. They just happen automatically. Birth and death. Can we change that? Can anyone here change birth and death? No. Can you change that you need to eat and drink and sleep and breathe? No. These are mechanical processes. Likewise, your ego is mechanical, but you can change that. Why? Because you created it. It's simple. You didn't create earth, the atmosphere, the moon and the sun. God did. But you made your pride. You made your lust. You made your envy. You made your fear. God can't fix that for you. You have to fix it. And if you can't, nature will fix it for you. But it's very unpleasant. How does nature purge a disease? Through pain. If your body becomes diseased, if it receives an infection like a cancer, how does the body care for it? How does the body purge it? Through pain, through suffering, and eventually through death. The same is true psychologically. Our psyche is infected 
with the disease that we call pride, fear, envy, greed, lust, jealousy. We are sick. This humanity is dying. The evidence is everywhere. Don't live in fantasy land. Look around you. This humanity is sick. And nature is beginning to cleanse the disease. But the way the disease is ultimately cleansed is through death. Physically, yeah, we will die. But there's also what's called the second death. Many religions call it hell. Avicii, Averno, Genna. Many names. The infernos. This is simply a process whereby, because the soul didn't do the work to redeem itself, out of compassion, God placed laws in nature that will cleanse the ego out. So if we don't take advantage of this human existence, and instead we just create more and more ego, more and more pain and suffering and karma, eventually the divine says, this human soul is lazy, is not doing his part, purge him out of compassion purge him. And so that soul is placed in hell. So that those forces and pressures, that suffering can purge that mind of disease. And that process takes time. And it's painful. But eventually, of course, that soul is cleansed and returns back to try again. But having gained nothing. The alternative is to do it ourselves, to take responsibility for our actions, to work daily, not just on the weekend, not just once a week, not just to go to church or temple for festivals and holidays, but to take responsibility for ourselves now and to learn how does my personality control my human machine? How are the egos in me manipulating my personality? Through shame about my body or pride about my body. Through envy for the wealth or the education or the love that I see others have. Through fear, through jealousy, what manipulates my personality? And then we have to apply the antidotes. The most important one, remember your divine mother. Remember your innermost. Not just as a thought. Not just to think, oh yeah, I have God within. Okay. That doesn't really dispel the presence of an ego, especially if it's a strong emotional affliction. To self-remember is to become cognizant, to become conscious, to be watchful. This is not a passive action. It is very active. You see, what happens here is a flip, a reversal. Most of the time, our personality is very active. In some people, it's easy to see. People who are very socially act outgoing, you can see their personality because they talk, they engage others, they're very active socially. It's easy to see that. It's an active personality. Inherently, there's nothing wrong with that. We all have different personalities according to our karma and according to our ast astrological influences and our circumstantial influences. And this is good. But that personality should be active activated by consciousness to be socially engaged consciously to be aware of what one says and why to be aware of the feelings of others to be concerned for them to love them and then we have other types of personalities that are more uh, reserved these are harder to see because they hide 
In reality, there are four main types related with the elements. Fiery, watery, or aqueous, airy, or gaseous, and earth, or petrous. These four types of personalities are related with the astrological signs, the 12 signs. Those 12 signs, three in each of the four groups. And each of us has a certain astrological influence, and thus we have a certain type of flavor to our personality. Don't assume that yours is the best. Because through the process of your development as a human soul, you have probably been all of them. In this life, you happen to be a Pisces or a Gemini or a Virgo. But in your last life, you weren't. And in the one before that, you were something else. But in each case, you were proud of it. Right? The effort then becomes to be aware of that. To not take it for granted. To not merely imitate and act mechanical, but to act consciously. Unfortunately, when we come into these studies, we bring with us our habits that we've always had. When we were children, we learned through imitation. We imitated our parents, our siblings, our friends, our neighbors. And the way we talk, the way we dress, the way we act, and our morals are all based on the imitation of the behaviors of others. Things we were told, things we saw. This is normal. Yet when you come to the Gnostic teachings, you have to stop. You cannot learn Gnosis by imitating me or any other instructor. Yet, if you go to Gnostic schools or other types of religious institutions, you will find that that's exactly what happens. The students imitate the teacher. They even start to all dress the same. I've been to some schools and institutions where everybody dresses in a very relaxed way, flip-flops and sandals and you know, comfortable. And you go to another school down the street and they all wear suits and ties. Why? They're imitating each other. That's all. It's personality. It's not conscious. But unfortunately, those groups, those people, project their personality onto the religion. And they believe that the personality defines the religion. So I've even heard of Gnostic instructors going to big congresses or meetings of Gnostics and being judged because of their clothes, being condemned and exiled because they didn't wear a tie. What is that? That isn't conscious value. That's personality. Because someone was wearing, they weren't wearing dress shoes, everybody was whispering, oh, he's fallen from the path. This is true. It's hilarious, but it's also sad, right? But this is how we are. We judge from personality, not from consciousness. Every group, every religion is guilty of this. The Christians have their culture, ways of dressing, ways of behaving, and there are hundreds of thousands of groups of Christians, and they all have their own approach. And they all believe they are right. And the same is true amongst the Hindus, the Muslims, the Jews, the Buddhists. And they each take personality, the culture they grew up with, the morals they grew up with, the heritage they grew up with, and they project that as though that is the best. And we do it. We think because we have a certain background, certain upbringing, certain ideas, that that is the pinnacle of civilization that we are on top. We are the peak of all of the human development through all the centuries. Everything, everybody that lived and died led up to this very moment of you. <laughs> right? The ultimate 
human being with the, the ultimate ideas about what life is and is not. And every one of us thinks that. It's personality. That's just personality. It's an illusion. It has no reality. But unfortunately, we bring that into our groups. We bring it into our religion. We bring it into our family. We need to evaluate it, to revise it. We need to question what we think is good and right and determine why we think that, why we feel it, why we believe it. Many of us come to these groups with a set of morals or ethics. Certain behaviors we believe are good and certain ones we think are bad and some that are indifferent. Yet we fail to realize that our very moral concepts have changed over the course of our life and have changed over the course of the generations and many times do a complete inversion. As an example, uh, a few decades ago, if you had spoken about homosexuality, about pornography, about masturbation, you would have been in danger of being beaten and cast in the street. Not long ago, if you had spoken of it, people would have condemned you and could have beaten you and even killed you for it. Nowadays, we celebrate it. It's everywhere. You cannot escape it. Now on television, movies, magazines, on the internet, everybody is celebrating these things. What kind of moral is that? Where are the eternal ethics in these qualities that we invert from one decade to another? And why is that happening? And who's behind it? It doesn't happen accidentally. And all of us have that. Things that we think are a certain way, which when we were a few years ago, we thought the opposite. In our last life, we thought something else. And in the one before that, something else. Where do we find the true eternal values when our personality is so contradictory and when our ego is constantly changing. We cannot find real morals, real ethics in humanity. Because the one that can give us that is inside. It is God. It is our innermost. That Buddha who is inside. At the feet of our real master, our innermost, we can learn real morals, real ethics, and the true upright way of behaving. We cannot learn it outside. We cannot learn it in a school, in a book, or from a teacher. The only teacher who can show us that is our own inner guru. So when we come to Gnostic schools, we go to religions, we go to university, remember that. The true ethics, the true morals, are related with the consciousness. A person who lives that way, who learns the ethic from within, is very different from most people. Some good examples, Krishnamurti. An excellent example of a man who did not learn his ethical or moral point of view from anyone else but his own inner master. He didn't study anyone. He didn't read anything. He listened inside. And what he expressed was a conscious moral ethic. Beautifully. Samuel Amvior is another. Who did not accept the moral, ethical, or dogmatic projections of anyone around him. He did what he had to do. And many times, even his closest students would reject him for it because they didn't understand, because they were trying to imitate him rather than following their own inner master. 
This is the problem. As close as you may be to a great master physically, if you are not close to your own inner master, you're wasting your time. It is your innermost who can teach you what you need to know. No one else. Therefore, it is essential for us to learn to see our own mask. And by becoming conscious of it, we can use it effectively. So then, the personality we've developed through the course of our life is no longer utilized to feed our desire, to hide our fears. It's no longer a tool of our cravings and our aversions. It becomes a tool of spirit that can be used to help others. This is the purpose of personality. It is to be a good human being, to contribute to society without self-interest. It becomes a vehicle of communication to help others, not oneself. And this is what was so beautifully represented in those ancient dramas, the Greek and Egyptian and, and Asian dramas. The actors were not there to be admired like actors are nowadays. Those ancient actors were there to teach, to not be seen, to be invisible. And this is what that mask was designed to hide. It was designed to hide the human person and instead represent a cosmic truth. But now our personality is there to show off our pride, to get attention. So our society tells us you have to have a strong personality, right? There are some very famous people nowadays who tell you, if you want to be successful, you have to have a big ego. And they're right. If you want to be successful in the world, but if you want to have success in heaven, you have to have no ego. Zero. When there is no ego, what's there? God. The solar personality. Our true self. So those ancient dramas can teach us a lot. Do you have any questions? question is, you know, how can we observe, you know, the fact that the ego is using all of these things to continue to do the thing that's been doing in previous lives? The way you learn about the function of your ego in relation with personality, especially in relation with previous existences, is to observe it here and now. When you observe it here and now, you get first-hand observation of the crime that's being committed. And that first-hand observation gives you a lot of evidence, as long as you're observing objectively, without self-interest, without condemning yourself, but just observing. And then at the end of each day, you meditate. You you withdraw from everything around you. Then you go within and you begin to imagine what you observed. We call this retrospection. A process whereby you review the conscious data you acquired that day. That process teaches you even more about how your ego is functioning, right? And how it's using the personality. That observation if the consciousness is active, will naturally lead you back to previous existences. It can lead you through memories of childhood that you've never remembered before. It can even lead you, lead you back into the womb through conception 
and back through the time between existences and the bardos that they called out. Those states of consciousness within which we didn't have a physical body. And then through death and then back into that previous life. It depends. If you're focusing on a particular ego or a particular psychological manifestation, you'll tend to follow that thread. So it depends on where that thread leads. It's not complicated. And anyone can have that experience if you make the effort to meditate, to observe. Another question? Ah, okay. The question is, why after being purged in hell do we start again with the ego? To clarify, the process of being purged in the infernal worlds is to cleanse one of the ego, is to remove it, to destroy it. Those fires have that ability. What remains is the pure essence, the consciousness or embryo of soul which cannot be destroyed by the fires of hell. What's interesting to note there is that the ego is lunar. It's created as a part of lunar nature. The consciousness is not. The consciousness is superior to that. So the consciousness cannot be destroyed by the lunar fires or the fires in mechanical nature. right? But the ego can. So when the ego is completely removed, then that conscious element, which unfortunately is undeveloped still, reinitiates a new process in order to try again. But unfortunately, tends to create the ego again. Another question? Well, that's a good question. Uh, do black magicians create lunar bodies through their tantric practices, or do we already have them? The process of the soul developing in the lunar kingdoms of nature is the process whereby the lunar bodies are created. So the simple essence enters into nature at the very beginning of its manifestation and evolves slowly over many thousands of years as it develops what we call protoplasmic bodies or lunar bodies. And this is basically lunar mind. It takes a long time for that process to develop. The pinnacle of that is us, humanoid organisms with a soul who have a lunar mind. Those are lunar bodies represented in the Tree of Life as those sephiroth that I mentioned. Black magicians, or those who practice uh, impure forms of tantra, merely fortify those bodies. All they do is strengthen them. They take the lunar forces and they multiply them through desire, through lust, through pride. And they make those lunar bodies more dense, stronger. The result is what's called a demon or a sura. Someone who has those lunar vessels very dense and strong, very strong pride, very strong anger, very strong lust, but awake. And they have powers, but they are not capable of ascending to heaven until those things have been completely dissolved. Therefore, if they don't enter the path, the solar path, then eventually, due to karma, they will also be digested by nature. But for them, the process is much slower because they worked so hard to make those bodies so dense. And they have a lot of karma. So it takes a long time. Another question? Do we gain the solar personality through elimination of the lunar personality? Or do we have an inner solar personality that is better expressed through the elimination of the lunar personality? The exchange or the, the process of the difference between the lunar and solar personalities depends upon the path that we choose to take. Merely eliminating the ego does not create a solar personality. 
As an example, we can cite the case of Paramahansa Yogananda, who is a very beautiful soul and gave very beautiful teachings, but unfortunately, he did not receive the entire Kriya. So he did not receive the teachings of how to create the soul. He didn't want that. He did dissolve a percentage of his ego and also worked through some aspects related with his personality. But he did not create a solar personality because he didn't create the vessels of the soul. He didn't accept that aspect of the teaching. On the other hand, we have other masters who, like Samael and Vior, who dissolved the ego completely, dissolved his personality completely, and was able to manifest the solar personality of his innermost. This is the distinction. The solar personality belongs to God. It doesn't belong to the human soul. The human soul is an aspect of a solar personality. You see, the, the real solar personality is the monad. It is chesed or atman, the real self. That is a solar personality. But that can only manifest once, fully manifest once the solar bodies are created, once that soul is fully developed. So there are grades and levels. Yes? Uh, the term past life regression implies a process of hypnosis or psychotherapy, which in this tradition we reject 100% because it is an unconscious mechanical tool. When we in this tradition investigate our past existences, we do it with a consciousness that is awake. In other words, there is no intermediary. There's no therapist or hypnotist who's there manipulating us. We do it ourselves by will. This is not hypnosis. It is not suggestion. It is not any kind of asleep consciousness. It has to be done awake. Otherwise, there's no value. If you're attending the sessions of a medium or a spiritist or a hypnotist, you're attending a fantasy conference. You cannot acquire conscious information about your soul unless you are conscious and awake of it. You can't get that information from anyone else or from any outside source. No person can come to you and say, you were this and that in your past life. If anyone says that to you, they are a liar. And even if what they say is true, reject it. Because you have not acquired gnosis of it yourself. So you have no way of knowing if it's a lie or not. You should only accept information about your inner identity that you've acquired from your own conscious experience. We have to be extremely rigorous on this point because it's very easy to be deceived. Our pride loves to hear stories about our past lives. Many people love to hear that they were great angels and saints in their past lives, but none of us want to accept the truth which is that we were all murderers and rapists and liars and poor people and people who just suffered. We don't want to hear that. We want to hear that we were Mary Magdalene or Napoleon, right? None of us want to hear the truth. The truth you can only acquire from yourself through conscious experience. Past life uh, information or learning about your past existences is extremely important precisely because it is there that you created your egos, the strongest ones. We're creating egos now, so let's start here. We start today, now, to stop creating karma, to become aware of ourselves, not merely physically, but intellectually and emotionally, to stop creating suffering. That alone is not easy to do. So for most people who enter into these studies, you really don't need to worry about your past existences right now. Worry about your present one. Fix your present life. Fix your behaviors today. And then, once you get that under control, you start really learning how to be observant of yourself, 
to learn about yourself, to control your personality, little by little, you can start to acquire information about the past because it's relevant to today. We all have a huge backload of egotistical desires and influences that are submerged in our mind. So we might be able to gain control of our personality in our daily lives now and appear to be solid, upstanding citizens. We don't realize, just below the surface, our egos that we created before, that in an instant can emerge and take control of us and cause us to commit incredible errors, like murder, or rape, or theft. We all have it. All of us have committed crimes in the past, and those tendencies are still in the mind. And those tendencies will emerge in the instant the conditions are right, and we are not paying attention. All of a sudden, someone who was on yesterday was an upstanding, beautiful, intelligent person, the next day is a convicted killer. Or has committed a great mistake against their spouse, or their children, or themselves. All of us have that potential. So don't sit back and think that you're good. Reflect and learn. And you'll find that there are things in your mind you never suspected. If you avoid it, it'll just come out later. It's better to deal with it now. Another question. Is it possible to stop creating karma? Is it possible to stop creating karma? Yes. It is possible but extremely difficult. The reason is that there are, there are three things that are eternal. Space, nirvana, and karma. Karma is simple cause and effect that modifies every particle in existence, even beyond the realm of the atom. Yet in order to enter into the absolute, into the uncreated light, which is beyond manifestation, one has to first have zero debts and zero owed. In other words, we have to balance the three gunas. This is only something that's possible for someone who has gone beyond the gods. It is not easy. It is rarely accomplished, but can be done. That is what it means to stop creating karma. While we're here, physically, we are creating karma. We have cause and effect. Every action we perform creates a result. That's karma. So let us make those actions good and conscious. Let us make our actions in harmony with nature and with the law but most of all in harmony with the will of our own innermost. And that way, <clears throat> little by little, we can pay our debts. We can raise the level of our being until, as a matter of work and self-knowledge, we reach the stage at which we start working directly with the forces of the gunas. But by that point, I won't be able to help you because I'm not there. Any other questions? Um, we talked about in this lecture how we change our personality as we go through our life in order to fit the various circumstances that we find ourselves in. Um, but some of them we are, uh, I believe, also mentioned that the personality is formed within the first seven years of our life. Is, is this correct? That's right. Um, we can we can see how we're changing our, our personality through time, but what did Samael mean when he talked about how it's, it's formed in the first seven years? Well, it's similar to how your body is developed. Your body grows and develops through the first 20-something years of your life, right? The personality is similar. It develops in the first seven. But it doesn't ever stop developing. Just like your body is always changing and growing, your personality is the same. It isn't a fixed, rigid thing. It's energy. So your body is also, it grows and develops until you're in your early 20s, right? But you can change your body now by applying different forces. Your diet, what you eat and drink, what you breathe, and your exercise, how you behave, all of that changes your body. 
Same as trivial personality. That's all. It merely is not something that is permanent and fixed. It's very malleable and flexible. Another question? Uh, it's not really a question, but it's an observation. Mm. Maybe you'd like to elaborate on it. But I've noticed, um, you know, you were talking about how heavy the personality is now, especially in this uh, day and age. Mm -hmm. And um, I've noticed it in a lot in movies lately where we're obsessed with Armageddon and the end of the world and how angels or demons or something's going to come down and save a few of us or you know, save humanity or whatever. I don't know. I mean, it totally relates to this lecture. Those movies and cultural phenomenon are happening for a reason. We don't often realize that much of what um, our culture processes emerges out of collective mind. And we gave a few lectures about collective mind and what that means. It's very related to personality because we develop our personality out of collective thinking. It's not individual thought. So all of these uh, cultural phenomena, for example, movies about Armageddon and aliens and extraterrestrials and, and doom coming out of the sky, they are there because they are reflecting a subtle consciousness that humanity has, that something is going to change. And everybody feels it. But nobody is brave enough to investigate it consciously and directly. So we have a lot of theories. For example, the whole 2012. Yeah. There's a lot of hysteria, just like happened in 1999. Right? And, yeah, I mean, it happens periodically. We get all hysterical because we have so much fear, because we are asleep. We aren't conscious of what's happening. If you awaken your consciousness, you can learn directly about these things. And moreover, you will not be afraid. It almost seems like the suffering gets so intense, you almost see like this mass suicidal tendency. Yeah, definitely. And there are people who kill themselves because they don't want to be left behind, or they don't want to pass through it. And they don't realize that they're just accelerating the process for themselves. Or fanatics that kill for religion. No doubt. There's a lot of that. And again, it all comes down to us being asleep. We're putting our faith in outside sources. Movies, TVs, books, theories, dogmas. None of that can help. The only thing that can help us fundamentally is awakening inside. Was there another question back there? I'm not sure about that. Senor? Yeah, the question is about Samael and Vior, who, when he dissolved his lunar personality, took on a, an ancient personality he had from past existence, which was Egyptian. And the question was whether he had eliminated that also. And it appears that he did. Another question? Yeah. You said that. Um a lot of people's personalities is you have to conform to and so they're able to conform to personalities in, in different areas and like the Gnostic school um, that conference you had to wear a tie or else you couldn't go in well I'd want to go into the to the conference and you know if, if you don't conform to things you make enemies it seems like if you don't laugh at the boss's jokes well you get fired so Sometimes you have your personality as a defense because other personalities are so strong. How do you manage the personalities that are coming in and interact with them you know, in, in a good way? This is the, the great challenge for someone who's serious in the Gnostic tradition, Gnostic studies, to learn to use the personality consciously. The example I gave was not uh, an intentional thing. The person didn't show up without a tie intentionally. It just happened that way. But um, for example, like you state, if you go to work and you're trying to be conscious and be authentic and you don't laugh at the boss's joke, you could get fired, right? It's true. So why not laugh? But laugh consciously. The interesting thing is that someone who's really conscious of themselves can use their personality for the benefit of other people, right? It, to be conscious of one's personality doesn't mean that you immediately reject everything around you and you rebel. It means that you do things consciously and willfully. 
knowing what you're doing. As an example, uh, if you could be um, a person who has a very, um, how do you say, sort of educated background, right, and speak a certain way. But then for your job or some other need, you have to go into a jail and work with criminals, convicts. You couldn't go in there and talk like a Harvard or, or a Wall Street businessman, right? You'd have to go in there and speak the language of those people. You'd have to do that consciously, to use your personality to effectively communicate and speak in a way that can be understood. That's something you can do consciously, where you use the personality for the benefit of others. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, but it, with, if you're at a jail, then the language you're going to use is probably going to be pretty crude. I mean, you're going to want to keep away of the negative influences. Maybe, maybe not. It's something you have to determine through conscious experience, right? Listening to the guidance from within. There's no, um, there's no golden rule here except to be awake, to be aware of oneself. Samuel and Vior made a statement in the Peace to Sophia, which is that in order to descend into the abyss and help the demons, sometimes the initiate has to dim his light. And what that means is that you cannot go and blind people, right? You can't go in there projecting yourself. You have to go in there at their level and speak to them at their level. So the example I'm giving is similar to that. If you're someone who's a Gnostic and who's developing yourself consciously, it doesn't mean you go around your daily life strutting around like a Gnostic. You have to blend in. We're not here to make ourselves look different. We're here to do our work and help humanity. And in most cases, that means you look like a normal person. You just are a normal person, because you are. Too often, we see people who take on these studies and start to do that. They strut around like peacocks and, and proclaim gnosis everywhere. This is not good. It's arrogant and often creates a lot of problems, right? We need to be humble and be authentic and realize we have a lot of defects, we have a lot of errors, but let's be honest about that, right? Just be yourself. Another question? Are relationships between people used partly for the purpose of reflecting individual personality traits back to the projector, therefore creating a reaction and enabling awareness of ego? I'm not sure I understand the question, um, but in, in general, in relation with um, people around us, family and friends, the Gnostic tradition, Gnostic studies emphasize that these relationships are very important, partly because they are karmic. We are born into our situation because we deserve it because our karma has created it. Secondly, we need it. If we've been born into a given situation, it's because the karma is there. And unless we comprehend that karma, it won't go away. We need to be in the situation we're in in order to understand ourselves. So some people think as soon as they find spirituality, they have to run off to another country or avoid their family and friends or quit their job. It doesn't mean that at all. It means you need to take advantage of those situations to learn about yourself. How did you get there? Why? What do these situations bring up about you? What can they teach you about yourself? And most of all, we need to learn how to love the people around us, but consciously. To serve them instead of seeking to be served. Because that's usually what we do. We usually expect things from our family and friends and our coworkers, and we don't usually Look at what we contribute, what we give. So Samuel and Vior emphasized repeatedly that our interactions with others are the best place for us to learn about ourselves, and it's true. Moreover, it is the best place for us to learn about sacrifice, to sacrifice our own ego, our own needs, and our personality so that others can benefit. I'm not sure if I answered that question, but 
Any other question? Can you tell the, uh, the traits that are with the uh, personalities, the earth, fire, wind, water? Well, there are certain tendencies in the astrological signs, and we had a course about that. There's also a book about that. But I would suggest to you to not rely on an intellectual structure or diagram of the personality types. And the reason is, yeah, there are 12 signs, but there are many grades within those signs. So you may be a Libra, but there are inferior types of Libras, and there are average types of Libras, and there are superior types of Libras. I mean superior, average, and, and inferior in relation with consciousness. So that means there are more than 12 types, right? There are a lot more. Moreover, the ego is there. And the ego modifies that according to karma, but also the personality. You can line up or fill a room with 50 Libras and they'll all be different, right? There'll be certain tendencies that might be similar, but you can't really categorize it. So what I would suggest is observe yourself. First, uncover your own tendencies, your own behaviors, your own personality type. Don't rely on a book. Don't rely on a structure but on your own information that you can gather. There are a lot of books you can go buy about personality types, and they have all kinds of fancy diagrams. They will only confuse you. Because then you'll say, okay, this book said that I'm A, B, and C. So now I'm going to go look for A, B, and C. And you won't see what's really there, because you'll be looking for something else. That make sense? So instead, forget that whole thing and look at yourself. There's a question here. Yeah, I was just wondering if you could talk just a little bit about the actual process of eliminating a defect. Um, for instance, I know you don't obviously think, all right, in this two months I'm going to take loss to get rid of that, you know. Um, is there a point when you, I mean, through your meditation, you just, I mean, comprehend it as if, like, oh, I get it now, and then, it's, and then you know it's... Right. Okay. Comprehension comes in many forms. The very beginning of comprehension is exactly that feeling of, oh, I didn't see that before. Oh, I get that. And often it's emotional, a feeling of regret or remorse, a feeling of, wow, I can't believe I was doing that. I can't believe that I felt that or that I thought that. That is a form of comprehension. The process of the elimination of an ego is a process of following your intuition. It begins by self-observance, by continually observing oneself and gathering information. It is synthesized through meditation. When you review that information and you analyze it without judgment, you analyze that information. Then as the analysis begins to lead you intuitively, you start to feel, wow, that way of behaving is wrong. And you may not be able to reason about it, right? To say it's wrong because of A, B, and C. But you know it's wrong in your heart. That's comprehension. Moreover, as you continue to observe yourself from day to day, you will see that pattern changing. And this is where you have to be, really be careful. The patterns of behavior <coughs> begin to shift. One, because the ego is trying to hide. Two, because unconsciously you begin to modify your personality to hide that behavior. And three, because the consciousness seeing that part needs to see more. So we need to awaken. You see, we may say, okay, I need to observe my lust. And I see my lust in relation with a particular person. So then, because we know that, from then on, we start to avoid that person, right? During our daily lives. Oh, I know I have lust for that person, so I'm not going to go over there. I'm not going to go by that cubicle or down that street. So that right there, our behavior's changed. Our personality has shifted. And the consciousness says, well, I don't see anything else in relation with that, so I'm going to keep looking somewhere else. Right there, comprehension stops. What needs to happen is that we continue to observe and investigate. Till little by little, when we observe ourselves, that psychological element we were looking for is gone. 
It doesn't mean that it's completely eliminated, but there has been a change. Sometimes it means it's more submerged. Sometimes it means it's eliminated. And it's something only you can know intuitively and consciously in yourself. To know a defect is completely eliminated is something you can only discover through your innermost. Only God can tell you that. Nobody else. I've heard instructors say, oh yes, you've eliminated that ego. It's ridiculous. How can anyone know that? Only God can know that. Another question? Okay, thank you. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Glorian Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah,